and the crowns, if you notice I have a crown, you know, he also has a crown, you know, you know, they represent superiority, you know. And if I'm representing that king symbol, that's the way, the way a black king will look, you know, wearing gold. So, what I did was, you know, I evolved slowly. It was like a process, evolution, you know what I'm saying? I started off as a young rapper, you know, not doing anything, went, wrote lyrics. The Big Apple, Brooklyn, Queens. Now what you're about to see right now is known as rapping and scratching. For those of you who don't know, there must be some out there. How many of y'all saw this before? Two of the rap gods, the best of the best, the creme de la creme. LL Cool J meets Big Daddy Kane in his mini documentary series, the LL Cool J Big Daddy Kane era. James Todd Smith, born on January 14, 1968, in Bay Shore, New York, to Andrea Griffith and James Lewis Smith, Jr. James Todd Smith, better known as LL Cool J. As a young lad growing up in middle class Queens, LL life was in shambles. His father, shot his mother and grandfather, nearly unlive with them both, but they survived the mayhem. I mean, we all probably have uh, witnessed trauma, uh, whether it was us individually or someone in our family or a friend. Um, and you can see it playing out in the transition of hip hop with rap music, uh, people writing, they started writing stories about the things they was witnessing and seeing. Um, so as well as it being traumatic instances in people suffering from PTSD that wasn't diagnosed, they also was being able to vent and perform some type of in-home therapy by being able to write their thoughts down to get them off. A lot of the rappers' environments wasn't the greatest. They have seen a lot of trauma, you know, in their lifetimes, you know. I think majority of African-Americans have witnessed some type of trauma. Um, but it's like a gift and a curse. The curse is you're going through the trauma but the gift is these guys and women make great music from R&B to rap and the list goes on. In desperation to get away, Cool J and his mother moved to his grandmother's house in Queens where he was raised. But even there, the abuse continued from his mother's ex-boyfriend. Since I was nine years old, you know, and when I was 11, my grandfather bought me a whole lot of equipment, a whole lot of musical equipment, about $2,000 worth. So what I did was, you know, I evolved slowly. It was like a process, evolution, you know what I'm saying? I started off as a young rapper, you know, not doing anything, went and wrote lyrics, wrote a lot of lyrics, then I started sending tapes into every record company. I went to a record store and I got all the rap records 
and I took the addresses off the rap records and sent a tape to every record company, every record company that was using rap at that time. Cool J started rapping at the age of 10. He was influenced by the hip hop group Legends, The Treacherous Three. Who is The Treacherous Three? The Treacherous Three was a pioneering hip hop group that was formed in 1978. It consists of DJ Easy Lee, Kumo D, LA Sunshine, Special K, and Spoonie G. Cool J looked up to the Treacherous Three rhyme style. He respected it. But if I could have your attention, Cool J and one of the members of the Treacherous Three will be in an all right war battle down the line. You know, now that I think about it, if you go back to LL's from from his from radio all the way to now, LL had superior rhyme styles, many rhyme styles. I mean, he really explained that on Walking with a Panther. If you go back and listen to LL Cool J's third album, Walking with a Panther, you will hear styles on that album that you hear today. As LL was entering high school, he attended Andrew Jackson High School in Queens, but it didn't last long. He dropped out in the ninth grade to record his first album, Radio. In the 80s, every rapper had a DJ. If the DJ was just as big as the rapper, LL DJ was known as DJ Cut Creator, a Queens native that he met at a block party and they began performing together. There was another DJ that rolled with the crew, DJ Bobcat. Bobcat was from the West Coast. He was affiliated with the crew, the LA Posse. There was another person in the background also, but very visual, he loved. That caught my attention. Um, I mean, it had to be my radio. Okay, why did radio stick out to you? You know, it was just that beat. It was that beat. That beat was crazy. The beat was hard. <laughs> the joint was. <laughs> that joint was nasty. I ain't gonna front. It definitely was probably the radio. I can't go nowhere without my radio. That was that was that was tough. Radio. I mean, he had another song called "I Need a Beat," but radio definitely was dope because it was part of a movie called Crush Groove back in the day. But I think what took L over the top, without him even knowing it, um, the other song was "Rock the Bells." I think that's just hands down. Everybody could come to agreement with that. But then he came with "I Need Love," man. To me, that was like the first love song, rap song that I heard. And I'm pretty sure people did it before him, but L is like the king of the love songs. And actually Kane had one too, you know, on his Long Little Kane album. Antonio Hardy, born September 10th, 1968, in the borough of Brooklyn. Kane grew up in a rough neighborhood, Bedford Stuyvesant. His father was a truck driver, and his mother, Ruth Bradley, worked as a registered nurse. He also has a little brother, Little Daddy Shane. Antonio Hardy 
better known as the Big Daddy Klein. Watch so I can tell time. And the crowns, if you notice I have a crown, you know, he also has a crown, you know. You know, they represent superiority, you know. And if I'm representing that king symbol, that's the way, the way a black king will look, you know, wearing gold. World famous, world famous, famous, famous. So, I think, <clears throat> personally, the gold chain probably had a significance just in our, our neighborhoods overall, whether you was a rapper, whether you was on the corner selling drugs, or whether you just was a fashion kind of person. Um, the chain kind of made the outfit even better. So, so in the perspective of a rapper, I mean, imagine just being a dope rapper with a chain. You just, who can stop you? But a lot of people could be faked out with that chain and not be a dope rapper. The gold chain in hip hop is, symbolizes we made it. You know what I mean? We finally made it, you know. It, it date back all the way to the to the drug dealers. When the, when the youth in the 80s seen the drug dealers with the gold chain, they looking at them like, yo, they made it. So now, you know, now it's a hip hop starter kit, but it, it, it date back to ancient times, you know. Uh, King David had a gold chain. Uh, all the pharaohs rock gold chains. Uh, King Tut rock gold chain. That's why they call it the King Tut. Yeah. Cut, you know what I mean? In his early years, Kane was like any other kid growing up. He wasn't into sports, but gained a love and passion of music. He also was a part of the 5% nation, the nation of Islam which he intertwined the teachings into his songs. As most rappers admire other rappers' rap skills, Kane admired this group called Cold Crush Brothers. Who were the Cold Crush Brothers? The Cold Crush Brothers was formed in 1978 in the Bronx. They were known for their memorable routines, which included harmonies, melodies, and stage-stomping performances. Kane's favorite rapper out of the group was Grandmaster Cass. He studied his style, and which made Kane a better writer for himself. Hear ye, hear ye, from far and near. The one they call the Big Daddy Kane is here as the party animal, sex symbol, soloist, vocalist, microphone miracle, here to react, attack as a man. Kane heard about this up and coming rapper Biz Marquee from Long Island that was on the rise through a mutual friend. He was telling Kane how dope he was on the microphone. Kane got tired of hearing it. He put Biz Marquee to the challenge. They met up at the Alby Square Mall, exchanged verses, and became friends since. Biz Marquee was with the label Cold Chillin'. And he told Kane that day, you roll with me, I'm gonna put you on. But one thing, don't tell nobody that you rap with Marley Mall. They eventually found out Kane could rap. And he signed with Cold Chillin. And he debuted his album, Long Live the Kane. And he also became a member of the legendary group, The Juice Crew. And the rest was history. Kane also had something special. He had a DJ, Mr. C. And what took him over the top? was his two dancers, Scoob and Scrap Lover. That made his show explosive. And actually, I did a, I did a show with Kane back around 87, 88, at this place called The Turtle in Niagara Falls. I opened up for him. And shout out to my, my, my guys that was did the concert with me. 
they brought they brought me along with them. Let me just get that straight. Aaron Liggins, George Simmons, G Ski Rock, A Dog D, A Z. And shout out to my man Greg Burke. You know what I mean? He was a part of it too. So that was a good, good experience. What? Why was the Juice Crew dope in their heyday? I'm offended at the question. Should I even dignify it with a response? <laughs> I guess I got to, right? Because you got those who don't know the history per se, and they didn't live, they weren't alive and experienced it at the time. I'm gonna say this. First of all, they were out of Queens. Queens Bridge in particular, the majority of them, I'm not sure. I, no, because Kane was a part of the uh, Juice Crew and he eventually became a part of it and he was from Brooklyn. So, the, but the Juice Crew, like the, the, the meat of it comes out of Queens. And think of any crew in the history of rap that you had like a, a pocket of MCs together who were dope, who when you looked at them all, you would rather join them because if you thought you could step to the crew, it would be difficult. Who do you think, excuse me, who do you really think you're better than? Yo, bro, yo, f first of all, shout out to the God, Molly Marl, but uh, you got Shan, Shantae, Kane, Craig G, Master Ace, G Rap, Biz Markey. Yo, that is an all star roster in any generation. It probably should be the best crew in the history of hip hop because they weren't necessarily a rap group. They were a crew f filled with a whole bunch of solo artists. And it would have been dope if they were thinking ahead of their time enough to come together and just do a whole bunch of Juice Crew projects. That would be, that, that would just make their history greater. But MC Shan, man, that vocal cadence of his, that high pinch cadence and his swag was crazy. Kane's lyricism was off the chain. G raps, cadences, and rhyme patterns were second to none. People be talking about that, you know, we always been talking about that Kane and uh, Rakim battle uh, possibly going down, been talking about that since the 80s. Why never mention G-Rap? First song I heard about Big Daddy Kane was Raw. I was actually at a nightclub. I wasn't even old enough to get in there. You know what I'm saying? Like they played that song and I was like, yo, what is this? I said, yo, this joint is, is dope, man. Then he came with the joint, set it off with this real high pitch guitar string. Similarities between Kane and Cool J? Well, obviously, they were, in my opinion, the first two rappers who consistently made making music aimed at women, cool, acceptable, great battle rappers. Even though these guys can make great studio um, projects, they were the kind of guys that convinced me that if they were in any city USA and a local rapper who was nice might want to test their metal, Kane or Cool J could give you that smoke. When it comes to the differences between them, I always thought that Kane was the better lyricist and also showman.
Well, you know, we see in their legacy as we speak. It's the 50th anniversary of hip hop, and they both still sound like they sound back then. You know, uh, LL is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which he should be, but I also think Kane should be there too. You know? So I would say with LL, his legacy, because that was your question, I mean, he's an actor, he still can do dope music. LL was good for the culture. Same with Kane. Kane, Kane, Kane has represented us as education, like, you know, educated black man, uh, speaks well, never, never knew Kane to be like having beef with nobody. Uh, you know, he represented us as well-dressed black man, like, you know, I can rap, but still dress well. So he's good for the culture too. Two good representations of black men that uh, hold the culture down, for real. Legacy, top tier, top Don Dadas, top Crocs. I mean, you can't get no higher than these two guys, especially with LL. But all around, you can't get no higher than this. I really ain't got too much to say about it. You know, they, they work speak for itself. LL catalog is beyond endless. Beyond endless. Kane, he's still touring since 87 off the same album. Ain't no doubt about it, women are challenged. Right. Find the right one, find the right balance. Yep. Been across the atlas, I experienced plenty of women. They wasn't blind, they just ain't see the vision. They used to think I was tripping. But they see me now and they know I wasn't. Cause I done found a queen and we on the sum. Empire, results of events prior. Made us what we are and that, straight fire. Straight fire. take a picture and they calling it art. If we a song number one on the chart, I used to live in the dark. Now I move with spotlights on me. Power couple, we just like that, homie. It is what it is. You official, handle your business. No cap, future ain't gotta live. Ain't gotta top. No, ain't gonna stop.